Ladies and gentlemen, to begin the 43rd Annual Policy Conference, please welcome the President of the American Academy of Nursing, Bobby Berkowitz. Hi there. Now I know what the Wizard of Oz feels like. Welcome, welcome. Uh, to the American Academy of Nursing's Transforming Health and Driving Policy Conference. I am Bobby Berkowitz, uh, a great pleasure to serve as your president. And it's my pleasure to kick off three exciting days of what we hope will be insight into the strategies and initiatives that are transforming health, leading change, influencing policy, and improving lives. And along the way, we will take time to honor the excellence in nursing profession, our nurse leaders, our colleagues, and of course, we are going to induct a highly accomplished cohort of new fellows. So I am thrilled uh, to report to you that we again have a high number of regist registrants this year, close to uh, 1,000. In fact, I think it may actually be over. A thousand, yes. We are grateful for the generous support uh, of our sponsors, and I would love for you to please join me in thanking all of our sponsors for making this policy conference possible with a round of applause. So many of us began this year gathering earlier today with the leadership workshop and luncheon. I hope that many of you were there. Um, these are signature events for the Institute for Nursing Leadership, the Academy's initiative to place more nurses on governing boards and commissions, task forces, and other state and national policy-related entities. The workshop featured a distinguished panel of nursing, healthcare, and public policy leaders and we had more than 200 fellows with us to think about how to secure appointments and navigate some of the challenges that may arise afterward. I want to thank Dean Pamela Jeffries and the George Washington University School of Nursing for generously supporting the leadership workshop. This year's leadership luncheon was graciously supported by the Southern California School of Social Work, Dean Marilyn Flynn and Ellen Oshansky, chair of the school's Department of Nursing and a board member for the Academy. I would also like to take a moment to publicly thank the co-chairs of the Institute for Nursing Leadership's National Advisory Council, Stephanie Ferguson and Angela McBride. As always, they did an extraordinary job of leading the Institute this year. The plenary sessions for this year's conference have been developed with the expert input from our conference planning advisory committee. And after I've called all of their names and they stand up, please join me in applauding their stellar work. First, our co-chairs, Susan Albrecht and Adriana Perez, and, and committee members, Mary Hagel, Tonda Hughes, Mary Ellen Roberts, Linda Scott, Margaret Wilmoth, Thad Wilson, and the Academy's lead nurse planner, Lola Fair. It's a lot of work to put one of these conferences on, and I am particularly grateful for, for your work this year. So this year's plenary sessions concur, continue and concur our annual focus on health policy issues where the knowledge and perspective of nurses is critical to driving policy change and promoting health and improving health care. There will be three groups of education sessions, plenary sessions on all three days, tomorrow's policy dialogues, and on three days, the high quality e-posters that you can view next door in the Marquee Ballroom, just right next door. Once again, we will strive for increased participant involvement that you have requested. And this year, we have something very high-tech, or at least in my book, it's pretty high-tech. We have our own app. 
Um, it's a conference app for your phones and your tablets. Uh, and you can see um, the schedule. You can s participate in Q&A in the plenary sessions. Uh, you can put your own schedule in there. It has all kinds of bells and whistles. Um, and you can download, download it from the App Store by searching American Academy of Nursing. Uh, we also have an app help desk, just in case you're like me and technologically challenged. But I have to say, if I can do it, you can do it. And I, I did load it this morning. Um, so please use the conference app to submit questions uh, to the moderators in real time. Or if you want, there's cards on the table and you can go ahead and fill those out and write your questions. Just simply raise your hand and one of our Jonas Policy Fellows will come and bring it forward. We probably won't be able to get to all of your questions, uh, but the moderators will really uh, do their best to accommodate as much as possible. So now please join me in welcoming to the stage Thad Wilson from the Planning Advisory Committee. He's going to um, introduce our opening keynote session. I'm really not going to dance. That's good music. But I'd like to welcome you to our opening keynote panel presentation today. It is truly a pleasure to welcome all of you here on behalf of the Academy. The panel today will be discussing the business case for care transformation. And as I call their names, I would like to invite them to come up, take a seat here on the stage. The first uh, panel today, panel speaker today, Dr. Margaret Flintner. Dr. Flintner is our Connecticut connection, I think, right? Let's give her a hand. I want to direct you, the full bios are in your program. So if you'd like to turn to those and read through those as they come up, uh, it'll give you a sense of who these uh, speakers are. Our second one is Dr. Susan Reinhardt. And Dr. Reinhardt is our connection for those of us young enough to belong to the AARP. And our moderator for this opening session will be Dr. Randy Jones. Our Virginia connection. Seems like we've got a lot of East Coasters up here as a Midwesterner. I apologize to those of you in the West that you didn't make it, maybe next time. Again, welcome everyone uh, and distinguished fellows and colleagues uh, to the keynote presentation. I am honored and to share the stage today with two distinguished speakers, Dr. Susan Reinhardt and Dr. Margaret Flinter. They will both introduce themselves a little bit later. Over the past several decades, a lot of changes have happened in the caregiving world as well as within the healthcare system. We have an, a transit population with people being more open to move away from home and more diverse population and cultures and people living longer, as well as a true financial makeup difference. Those and other factors have a great impact on the caregiving system and healthcare system that we live in today. Before we get started, I would like to remind everyone to please place their phones on silent, um, and then also, we'll save all questions until the end of the um, presentations. So within that, I would like to begin by welcoming Dr. Susan Reinhardt. Well, now that's interesting. That's a different picture. <laughs> I hope we have the right slides. We'll see. So uh, Susan? A senior Vice President at AARP. I direct the Public Policy Institute there. Also Chief Strategist for the Center to Champion Nursing in America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but mainly, I come to you as a visiting nurse. And that really is my core identity. I uh, started there as a new graduate. Well, you know, the six months in a hospital thing. But then as a visiting nurse. Uh, and it remains really the very core of who I am and has driven me to be here today, frankly. Uh, I certainly practice teaching at Rutgers University uh, and research 
decades ago looking at caregiver burden and how professionals can better support family caregivers, trying to increase their sense of mastery over their very complicated demands of family caregiving. And then to public policy. That's where I am and have been for quite some time now in public policy. And that is, for me, is all about translating research into practice, but into policy, where you can affect whole communities, society at large. Uh, some of you may have heard me say this. I know Diana Mason in the room would have heard, maybe I got it from her, actually, is that public policy is nursing intervention at the community level. And I, I feel that all of us in this room who are Academy Fellows share that core value on public policy, and uh, so we have a lot in common. But for me, uh, this focus on family caregiving started with a patient and her husband when I was a brand new visiting nurse in New Jersey. The patient, Mrs. Charlotte Clark, of course that's not her name, that's my mother's maiden name, uh, so she could be with me today, uh, was, was an older adult, a retired teacher, and she was suffering from ALS, you know, Lou Gehrig's disease. Her family caregiver was Joe. Joe was also retired. Charlotte, as you can imagine, with the diagnosis of ALS, was having trouble swallowing. And so late one Saturday afternoon, I was on the weekend duty. I was dispatched to uh, their home to insert a nasogastric tube and to teach Joe how to take care of this tube and to give the tube feedings. So I did that, went there. Again, brand new nurse, right? Brand new visiting nurse. Uh, this is seared in my brain, truly. Uh, and I put the tube in, I was really glad it went in, showed him how to make sure it's there, it's not in the lungs, that it's in the stomach, and then showed him how to use a bulb syringe to gradually put the fluid in for the meal. And then I said, I'll see you tomorrow because, you know, visiting nurses don't stay overnight. Of course, he was looking a little pale, a little shaky, and so I gave him my home phone number, which I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to do, but I did, and just so that he would know he would have somebody he could call. I did come back the next morning to watch him give the tube feeding as that return demonstration, as we like to call it, and he did it. He checked everything right, he put the, the fluid in, and uh, his, his wife was looking at him with, uh, with encouragement. Remember, she was a retired teacher, so she was very encouraging. <laughs> Plus, she needed to get the tube feeding. And I remember standing there and just thinking, wow, they are so brave. I just went to school, learned how to do all these things, and uh, here he is. Joe clearly adored his wife. There was no question about that, and that he was not going to have her go to a nursing home, at least until that would be absolutely critical. He was going to have her home with him for as long as he could. And uh, this was the beginning, truly the beginning of my career-long quest for how professionals can better support family caregivers. And I know, and I'm sure you do too, that family caregivers do things that made us shake the first few times we were doing them. So I know many of them of you are with me. I was asked to speak about, I hope these are the right slides, I was asked to speak about the new normal. Let's see if it goes, there you go. So this is the new normal of family caregiving. To the left you have, I don't think I'm allowed to walk, so uh, from the, on the left you have a family with, count them, nine siblings. So a lot of capacity for taking care of one another, to, for taking care of an older parent, for example, maybe another large family in the neighborhood that they could help. That's not, we are these days. I was one of six children. I have two children, uh, like others, smaller families, more, more spread out around the country, some of us acro across the world. And so we, but we still continue to try to do it, to try to take care of our older adults and people of all ages when they need it. And they're doing a lot. So I want, this study uh, on the left here, Home Alone, is a study I did with Carol Levine at the United Hospital Fund a few years ago. Some of you are quite aware of it. And what it showed was that families were doing things that I saw Joe do with Charlotte decades, literally decades earlier, and many patients since that time, and you know it, they're giving tons of medications and they're giving injections and wound care and special diets and ventilators. It's just unbelievable 
what family caregivers are doing. We call them medical nursing tasks in this report. But what we found out more significantly was that although half, and, and actually subsequent research has shown more like 60% of family caregivers are doing these things, they're getting very little instruction and support in knowing how to do them. They are worried about making mistakes, and they really don't even know what questions to ask. So when we talk, I remember one family caregiver saying in a focus group, you know, why don't you ask questions? Well, we don't know what we don't know. So how can we ask the questions? And they don't all get a visiting nurse. That's another whole study because these patients are going in and out of hospitals routinely pretty much throughout the uh, year that we were studying them. By the way, I want to thank the John A. Harper Foundation for funding the study. <laughs> and, uh, and hopefully we'll do some more work with them. The National Academies to the right, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine just released, just last month, released a report on families caring for an aging America. And that report says it again, that family caregivers are providing very complex care, often for many, many years. Their focus, focus was on older adults, but I know from others and from our own study, these are for people across all ages. So they're desperate for help, and we have to help them. This is why. So I was asked to speak to the business case. The business case is that they are giving $470 billion of free care every year. $470 billion of free care every year. We have this data. I've, I've done this with my colleagues at the ARP Public Policy Institute. We actually have the data by state if anyone's interested. And what it shows is that we can't have them walk off the job. We need to support them to do this job. It also shows that this value is about equal to the annual sales of Walmart. You've probably all been there, right, Walmart? It's the largest company in the entire world, their annual sales. I won't go through them all, but look at that bottom one. More than all of Medicaid, Medicaid for people of all ages, not just long-term care, Medicaid across the entire country. This is huge. So, you know, if you have to put a dollar on it, which we did, we, they really deserve help. So this is one way that we're trying to do this. This is why I love ARP, by the way, working at ARP, because they took the research by a nurse and translated it into policy proposals known as the CARE Act for each state legislature to continue, uh, to consider. It's the Caregiver Advise, Record, and Enable Act. Pretty simple, three things. Anybody going into a hospital of any age, any diagnosis, has to be asked in the states that have passed it whether or not they have a family caregiver. Not just next of kin, but somebody who's actually providing that kind of care. And if so, would they like them in the electronic health record? Two, if they are expected to do any of these kinds of medical nursing tasks, that they would be offered instruction. And three, that they would find out when the discharge was planned as soon as possible, ideally 24 hours at least. We know that's always dicey. But the idea is that a family caregiver can be prepared. It's really simple. When I tell people this, it's like, really? We need a law? We need policies to do this? But it is quite profound what a change it is already making in the states that have considered it. So it, we started in uh, 20, uh, 2014. The red states are the ones that have already passed it. It's 33 states and territories. The states that are in the dark gray, there's seven of them, are considering this policy now. And then the other 13 states in light gray are not currently looking at this, but they might. So figure out what state you're in and figure out whether or not you can be part of it. I do want to call out some fellows who have been quite involved in their own states in either promoting this policy or involved in the implementation of policy. Linda Aiken, Pennsylvania. I know she's not here because she broke her ankle. Uh, Diana Mason is here from New York. Heather Young also broke her leg. California, I know. <laughs> Pretty weird. <laughs> And we also have um, Barbara. So Barbara Given in Michigan was another one that has been very involved in this. So take a look, see where you are.
We are also looking at a scan of how this policy is being implemented across the country. We're just starting this scan. Actually, Diana and Heather and Barbara are all very involved with me on this. Uh, we're just starting to look. This is not an evaluation. This is promising practices. What's going on out there? And I would suspect that many of you either are directly or you have faculty or you have colleagues that are involved in promising practices. By the way, we know this shouldn't just be hospitals, but it's a place to begin. So what, are, what good things are out there to help family caregivers learn in this space between, the gap between what they're expected to do and what they've been taught to do? How do we fill that gap? So I'm creating this Home Alone Alliance. It's an, uh, an alliance of organizations, mainly individuals, some individuals, who want to get together and put their energy towards filling that gap. Here are some that are the founding partners of this. And we will be gathering more. I brought information if anyone's interested, so that we will be launching in December and thereafter. Because it's not as if we have all the answers. But one of the things we have been doing with the, there it is, with the, um, with UC Davis, uh, Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, is to create a set of videos. These are the first videos that have been designed specifically for family caregivers. They, uh, this one is the set on medication administration, like eye drops. People think people know how to give eye drops, not so. Uh, patches, injections, a whole series. They are on our website in sort of a soft launch, and they're going to be released through the American Journal of Nursing starting next month. Rolling forward, Sean Kennedy, if she's in the room, thank you very much. Uh, and we are also in the field next week with another fellow uh, who is Gail Powell Cope with the Veterans Administration in Florida, but she'll be here in DC to help us on mobility. How do family caregivers help people get in and out of a car without breaking their leg, which actually did happen uh, in a very noteworthy case in Oklahoma? How do they get up and down the stairs? How do you use the kinds of equipment that we think is pretty simple, but they don't think is so simple? So that's what we're trying to do. And so join me, if you can. I thought, I really, this isn't quite the right one. <laughs> we had another one. The um, Twitter handle, you have Susan, at Susan Policy. And if you're interested in talking to me more about any of this and joining what I consider a national movement and how we can better support family caregivers, I really want to hear from you. And in fact, you know, maybe I'll get you a drink. See you later. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome, and a special congratulations to all the new fellows. And my Bright Idea Award of the Day goes to whoever came up with the little sticker for new fellows, so we can see who all the new fellows are and congratulate you, even if we've never met you before. So great, great idea on that one. Susan, great to uh, share a keynote with you. I did not realize we both were visiting nurses in our first jobs out of school. That must be why we instantly liked each other. I might be the only person who ever went from being a visiting nurse to ICU, just to see what that transition was like, and back out again to the community. So my name is Margaret uh, Flinter, as I was introduced. I'm a family nurse practitioner. I'm the senior vice president and clinical director of a large statewide community health center uh, that delivers care in Connecticut, but is working nationally on practice transformation in communities, in community health centers, in primary care around the country. And uh, as part of that mission, uh, clinical excellence, research and innovation, and training the next generation are the three things that I'm most involved in. So I have the great pleasure uh, today and the assignment of spending a few minutes uh, stimulating our conversation and thinking about the business case for transformation of care in the community. Uh, it's near and dear to my heart because I'm so fiercely committed to transforming care in the community and without this transformation, I think it's going to be very hard to deliver on our promise of helping everyone in all communities achieve their full human and health potential. At its simplest, a business case is an argument. It's an argument that convinces the decision maker, sometimes it's ourselves talking to ourselves, I'm sure you've all had that conversation, to approve some kind of action or investment and articulate a clear path to a great return on our investment. Short-term action leading to short-term results, those are pretty much the easiest ones to argue and the easiest to sell. But community care transformation is a lot more complex than that. Complex problems don't have simple answers. They take time, 
and they involve lots of different people and organizations. And the hoped for return on the investment, as many of you have learned, don't always accrue back to the investor. They may accrue in other directions. Now, I come from a family of social entrepreneurs. My husband uh, is recognized as a first-generation social entrepreneur in the social responsible business space. My stepson's a chip off the old block. He's a second-generation social entrepreneur, and it looks like my son to all of our stunned surprises following in their footsteps. I've adopted their thinking about the business case from the socially responsible business community. They think of the bottom line as a triple bottom line, people, profit, and the planet. So for my purpose today, the triple bottom line of the business case for transforming care in the community, still people, patients and families, the second, practices and providers, they're people too, and the third, payers, particularly public payers who set so much of the health policy in our country and to which we have to contribute. Now, please take it as a given, and I really didn't think I needed to say this to this group, but I'll say it anyway, that I understand, as you understand, that when we talk about the business case, we're talking about the human case and that these are intertwined. So in the examples I'm going to give you, I'm gonna look at three areas of transforming care in the community. I carry the image of the real life people in real life communities that are affected by these transformations, whose needs have driven these transformations. When I talk today about how team-based care is transforming care in the community. I hold the image of Sarah He, the RN complex care manager, as she talks about her patient, the wildly out of control diabetic, recent immigrant, terrible trauma history, and how with complex care management under her direction, he has slowly come into control in better health. When I talk about the second area, moving knowledge and not the patients, I'm thinking about a nine month old baby with severe non-resolving dermatitis, and the only response the primary care provider could get when trying to get a dermatology appointment was, we have an appointment for him six months. Now that's less than 48 hours. When I think about the rise of community care teams, the third thing I'm gonna talk about, to address the hot spotters who need so much more care and so much more help than any one practice could give them, I hold the image of Terry, well known to me from the streets homeless and alcoholic, as he went from 85 visits to the ER in one year to none in the next six months after a community care team wrapped its intensive arms around him. So the business case may be accruing to the individual in cost savings from better health, better productivity, decreased health care costs. It may be to the practice and the provider in enhanced revenue through new services, quality payments, or productivity. And it may be to both public and private payers where the return is measured directly in actual and potential reduced health care costs and a more sustainable future for our country. So let's start with team-based care, a transformation that's well underway across the United States. And maybe I can move it. So we have very solid evidence now that team-based care works, but it's still a work in progress to get it totally adopted across the country. We have research that shows better outcomes in preventive care, in overall cost, in chronic illness management, and in team vitality. I have had the pleasure of serving as the national co-director along with Dr. Ed Wagner of the McCall Institute of the LEAP Project, Learning from Effective Ambulatory Practices, which was the brainchild of Academy Fellow Mary Joan Ladin and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And over these past several years, as we studied 30 different practices whittled down from a universe of 300 practices because of their strong team-based model, we learned a lot about what is transformative about team-based care. Care is shared. Care is planned. Care is coordinated. Missed opportunities for prevention and health promotion are identified and tracked on a daily basis. An entire team is wrapped around the patient at the center, and the team members have the ability to ensure that all the recommended care is delivered, that prevention and health promotion is attended to, and the chronic illness care is optimized across the lifespan. And each person on the team has a well-defined role. Each person on the team makes a unique contribution. In addition to the team lid of the primary care provider, nurse practitioner, MD, PA, and a medical assistant, we now found it is the rule in this study, not the exception, that there's a registered nurse on the team and increasingly a behavioral health clinician as well. Less frequently, but emerging enough to see this as a pattern that is likely going to become stronger, the teams share pharmacists, dietitians, 
even chiropractors, physical therapists, even dental hygienists. And these are just the onstage players. Offstage, there are quality improvement specialists, business intelligence specialists, and all of these players are making sure that that team has the data they need to provide care that is timely and exquisitely well coordinated. And during this conference, you're going to have the opportunity in one of the policy dialogues to hear much more about how our ends in particular are partnering in the transformation of primary care. We saw in LEAP practices across the country, and I've personally seen in health centers around the country, this transformation. As Ellen Marie Whalen of the Academy has written about, and as Tom Bodenheimer recently wrote about in the New England Journal of Medicine, with a not so surprising set of interesting comments in response, registered nurses are deeply engaged in managing patients with chronic illness as part of a team and taking on much of the management of routine chronic illness using strategies like protocols and delegated order sets to respond to the changing clinical responses of the patients, along with their traditional roles in education, support, and coaching. So what's the business case here? RNs are no longer to be thought of as a cost center, but also in care of the community. They are value creators, revenue centers through appropriate and legitimate billing, which some practices have been slow to realize. In my own state of Connecticut, RNs were formally recognized last year under new Medicaid regulations as allied health professionals in the community, qualified to bill the services they provided. And thanks to Medicare's recognition of the importance of care coordination, case management, and transition management, RNs in many practices now lead these activities, allowing the practice to bill and receive additional payments for these vital services. And they are essential positive contributors to the bottom line value-based arrangements that reward practices for achieving quality markers as well as in fee-for-service systems. As important as the RN and team-based care is, so is that fully integrated behavioral health clinician. The same space, the same team, supporting the panels of patients. Gone or going are the days in primary care in the community when patients re requiring needing standing to benefit from the care of our behavioral health colleagues needed to go to that other building, that other wing, the one that said mental health over the door, and to which our patients, about half the time, never made it to after the referral. And this is becoming the norm in private practice as well as in the safety net setting. All of these people on the team represent a cost, but they also generate revenue and represent the most efficient and effective use of our resources, and all have evidence-based support for a positive return on the investment. So let me move on to a second transformation that's going on in the community, moving knowledge and not the patients. Primary care is one point on the continuum, though it is the point that the experts agree is where we should focus most of our effort, most of our resources, most of the time. But primary care can't do it alone. We need our specialists and our expert consultants. When we as primary care providers know that we need help, guidance, expert opinion, we refer. And what does that mean to patients and families, particularly those patients who are challenged by geography, by language, by type of insurance, by age, frailty, transportation, or simply not having the luxury that most of us do of taking time off from work without suffering a loss of income to go to yet another appointment. Evidence suggests that this gap, access to specialty care, is one of the most persistent health disparities in our society. And data suggests that up to 50% of all referrals in the safety net setting are never completed. And when they aren't, we have a failure to resolve the consulting question. We have a provider left with uncertainty, a patient left hanging, and we can do much better than this. Using a model first piloted by Drs. Mitch Katz and Hal Yee in San Francisco of e-referrals, this is pre-EMRs, EMRs, they were using fax machines, they showed that we can move the knowledge and not the patients. And study after study has shown that e-consults has at least 50% of the time can resolve the consulting question without the patient having to be seen in person. There is evidence for overall cost savings and evidence for equal or better clinical outcomes. Enough so that the state of Connecticut on the basis of positive clinical outcomes demonstrated in a randomized controlled trial looking at cardiology e-consults passed legislation last year making e-consults a covered service under Medicaid. And Anthem Blue Cross has just followed suit on the private side. And this winter, Rhode Island also followed with Medicaid coverage. Moving knowledge, not patients, is good for payers. It reduces costs, particularly, as we saw in a randomized control trial, through duplicate testing 
and additional ER visits. Because what do we tell that patient while they're waiting three months for the referral? If anything happens, go to the emergency room. And in this case, it appears patients listen to us. It's good for patients who get rapid responses on their clinical issues, but are spared the time, travel, lost work, and out-of-pocket expenses associated with the visit. And it's good for primary care providers who get the support they need from their colleagues. And it's good for specialists who can focus on the patients who truly need their in-person care. There's a second dimension of moving knowledge, not patients, that I'd like to talk about briefly, and that's Project ECHO. Probably well known to many of you, certainly those of you from New Mexico, where it was first developed by Dr. Sanjeev Arora as a strategy to solve the problem of access to specialty care in a different way, in his case, treatment for hepatitis C in his rural and sparsely populated state. His innovation, Project Extension for Community Health Outcomes, or ECHO, uses teleeducation to bridge knowledge gaps between specialists at academic health centers and now specialists in the safety net setting and community health centers, and primary care providers, we used to say in remote areas, but now rural, urban, special settings like the prisons, rural schools in New Mexico. It's been implemented to address multiple medical conditions, but it's truly led to a transformation in how community-based primary care teams can take on the management of the most complex challenges, again, by moving the knowledge, not the patient, this time adding in the dimension of a whole team of experts in specialty areas connecting to that community of primary care practices, regardless of geography. It combines teaching, participation, case presentation, consultation, and feedback. And today it's being used to manage some of our most complex issues, chronic pain, opioid addiction, HIV, hepatitis C, and I'm proud of Dr. Mary Blankson and my own organization who has created, is our chief nurse officer, and has created the first project ECHO created for nurses for our own complex care managers to give them the support that they need from a team of experts, multidisciplinary, and providing complex care management. And the business case for this Project ECHO model, the October issue of Academic Medicine did a review of 39 studies looking at the effectiveness of ECHO, and the findings suggest participation in Project ECHO changes provider behavior. I've certainly seen that relative to the prescribing of opioids. It changes patient outcomes. It's been demonstrated in numerous trials and it's at least two of the studies shown to be cost effective. But I would add a different dimension that really ties to the dimension of team vitality, to the business case here. Support for the isolation that can be part of care in the community, particularly as the space between hospital and community has grown wider. Imagine the impact of weekly support to new clinicians, new nurse practitioners, new physicians, new social workers, of learning how to manage patients with chronic pain or HIV or opioid addiction and getting all the support and the help that they need. And finally, the third transformation I want to talk about is the creation of community care teams. All patients are not created equal. This is not a surprise to you. Some require more, many multiples more of our time, our intensity, and the resources in the community. And not any one practice can effectively address these needs or the consequences of adverse social determinants of health like homelessness, poverty, alcoholism, addiction, chronic mental illness, and poverty. Alone or in combination, these conditions often lead the patient to very excessive visits to the one place where the door is always open and the lights are always on, the emergency room. Now, we were first uh, introduced to this concept, I think many of us, uh, by Jeff Brenner and his hot spotter work in Camden, New Jersey, written about in the New Yorker magazine years ago. In Hennepin County, Minnesota, the Commonwealth Fund has been reporting on the progress of an accountable care organization created just to target this population that needs so much more, bringing together the health department, the public health people, the hospital, the community health center. And they just issued a new report on October 7th of this month, using different kinds of healthcare workers, traditional and non-traditional, focusing on housing and rapid rehousing when housing is lost, They've created a strong business case for intensive care of high-need Medicaid patients in the community. For the participants, the outcomes are pretty clear of what they've showed. Housing, security, better health, and hope. For the payers and the providers, 11% reductions in cost per year, year over year, shared savings in the millions of dollars which can be distributed to the partners for reinvestment in the program. And community care teams are being formed at the local level by local people all across the country. Colleagues in nursing, social work, medicine, psychiatry, case managers, P3 
people from the ER, the health center, the homeless shelter, the VNA, coming together to create a strategy that identifies those most in need, often as simply as based on the number of ER visits in the past year. And much of that care is not medical care, and they are yielding dramatic reductions in cost. We know that the target population for intensive community care teams does not get better with the traditional model of care delivery. We know that behavioral health and addiction issues require intensive and highly customized care. We know that the integration of housing and healthcare communities is critical for addressing the social and medical needs of this population. And I think it's now safe to say we know that communities need a organized community care team to respond to those needs. Now these are just three areas where care is transforming. I would suggest I could have picked a range of others, from school-based health centers to PACE programs, to public investments using social impact bonds to partner with government and drive positive change in communities. But let me end with a moment of focus on the payers, and particularly the public payers, as I said earlier, who so often set precedent. We have seen a revolution since 2010 and the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Let's see if I get that last slide up here. Maybe not. And efforts to use payment to drive innovation and transformation. And there's been some real progress, particularly in decreased readmissions and improvements in measures of chronic illness and adoption of electronic health records. Each of these bold ideas that we talked about today has had its genesis in the brilliant idea and the groundwork of the front lines. Somebody, some bodies, some groups and alliances had to have the bright idea that could become the policy of the payment people, indicating that this was a sustained change worth investing in. And I want to acknowledge that many of you in the audience are originators of those bright ideas. So coming up, we have MACRA, Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, going into effect in January. For those of us in the community, it's pretty clear. You can start by doing a little in terms of quality focus and reporting on how you are improving and transforming care. You can start right away in January, or you can even wait until the later, till later in the year. You can choose to do a lot and potentially reap a lot of return on your investment. But there's one thing that you can't do. You can't do nothing. You can't not be on this train of improving and transforming care, at least not without suffering a consequence in terms of financial penalty. And on the Medicaid side of the house, we see an enormous shifting towards quality and shared savings incentive programs. My home state, under a state innovation model, which most of your states have as well, a SIM that they're working on, in January will provide an opportunity for practices to participate in shared savings quality outcomes program. And it's very interesting. There's an opportunity with funding to significantly increase the volume and intensity of our efforts in the areas I described earlier, plus more, all really involving intensive care coordination to those who need it most and to perhaps generate millions of dollars in savings, which are then available to be divided between the state and the practice. But not a penny, not a penny can be collected by the providers, by the practices, unless stringent quality measures are met. In other words, maybe for the first time, our incentives are all aligned towards doing the right thing by the patients, by the providers, by the payers, which is ultimately what we seek. The business case, then, for transformation of care in the community is nothing other than our story as it's always been, the story of continuously striving to improve, to innovate, to transform, to make things better for our patients, families, communities, and our country. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank um, both um, Dr. Susan Reinhardt and um, Dr. Margaret Filinter for giving us a great presentation and for um, giving us some things to think about. Um, we're going to start to open it up for questions. So I think we'll have some floater uh, mics going on up around um, on either side of the um, stage. Um, I have, have one question here, um, and then I'll get you some of mine. Um, you mentioned caregiver use of their loved one's patient portal. Have there been any studies on adoption of proxy access to their records and the result and the resultant benefits? 
Oh, I, I didn't mention a portal. I said that the family caregiver's name can be placed in the electronic medical record so that they can be included in the plan of care. However, there are also the work that we're doing at ARP Public Policy Institute to address that, and we're doing focus groups right now to see the extent to which family caregivers want to do that, mm -hmm. do do it, whether their purse, the patient wants it, to what extent they do it, uh, and whether or not they want control over information across the doctors and nurse practitioners, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we will be releasing that uh, probably in six months. Okay, great, great. Um, there's another question. Um, in regards to, you know, as we're moving to this um, transient um, environment and as we see that um, there are caregivers are getting younger due to, you know, people are having their children at a later age and so forth. Where do you guys see and foresee in the future for in the next 10 to 15 years how healthcare is going to change and how these caregivers may change, particularly due to financial issues or even policy changes that may occur? Mm -hmm. So I'll start and you want to? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so uh, we also released a study last year that we did with the National Alliance for Caregiving. We do it every four or five years to get a fix on where things are with family caregiving. And to me, one of the most interesting findings is that one in four family caregivers right now is a millennial. Hmm. One in four. That was a surprise to us. And by the way, we only started at eight, age, age 18. We know that there are children that are doing this. I see my president, Alicia George, <laughs> George is going like this. Uh, and so there's that multicultural uh, issues are huge. We also looked at caregivers by uh, the amount of hours, people under 20 hours, people over 20 hours, really growing in the intensity. And most caregivers are working. So trying to help them stay on the job so that their economic well-being for themselves and for their family is, um, is huge, which means we need to work with employers. So we are doing more work with employers. Uh, and there's a whole road. I, I just talked about the CARE Act. We're doing a lot on respite care, on um, uh, access to other services. I mean, the best thing you can do with family caregivers is have be better services for the patient, mm -hmm. which is probably where you are. Right, yes. right, exactly. And you know, I, I uh, was thinking as you spoke, I, I have to admit I was never a big fan of those care plans we all did back in our undergraduate nursing days. I am a very big plan, a very big fan of care plans in the electronic health record mm. for our complex patients, which are many of the patients that you described. Those, those care plans are all about the team-based care, right? And they do include the family caregivers, and they do include how much that person wants to be involved. Uh, and it, it brings everybody together, including the uh, community daycare providers uh, and others. But I think there's another element of, I'm not sure it quite fits into the moving, uh, moving knowledge, not patients, but in the space of uh, telehealth, the ability for family caregivers and patients who are just complicated and often have trouble leaving home, the ability to have face-to-face -face virtual visits is just huge. And I don't know, how many of you have had a face-to-face uh, -face virtual visit for a medical problem or a healthcare problem? Yeah, not, not too many. My, uh, my company, uh, we just selected a new insurance vendor, and for the first time, our staff will have access to having face-to-face -face visits if they have an episodic mm -hmm. concern. Uh, I think that is going to translate very well to the kinds of patients that you're talking about for whom if the issue can be resolved without all the stress and demand of going in for care. What no, I'm effect? really glad you mentioned that because telehealth is one of the big, we put that under caregiving actually. Winifred yeah. Quinn, who is sitting up here, is, is our point person on this. And there are many policy barriers to telehealth. We know scope of practice issues. We know the compact. Some of you are aware of that, not only for nursing, but for other professionals as well. But there are reimbursement, policy, Medicare policy, tons of barriers to doing this. We are completely with you on the need yeah. for telehealth. And I think we're chipping away at some of those barriers as we, we've seen with some of the coverage that's beginning to come through. Yeah, and I guess a little follow-up to that with um, the telehealth piece. Have you guys seen any potential barriers or even facilitators as far as in the billing aspect of telehealth when it's at an administrative site and then how does that build or, sure. or use? Uh, or I think it probably varies a lot by state and you might be able to speak to the federal policy uh, better uh, than this than me, but on a state by state basis, we're seeing coverage of telehealth defined as a continuum. 
everywhere from asynchronous communication between providers and specialists, face-to-face uh, -face communication between patients, communication with teams of people. So that is being covered at least in a couple of states now. Medicare does not pay for this routinely, so that's a big issue. There is a concern, I think MedPAC actually expressed this concern, that it may produce increased costs because it would be so easy to have this kind of, and then there's fraud and abuse. I mean, there's lots of issues, sure. uh, but we think we'll overcome them someday. Yeah. Right. Soon, hopefully, yes. <laughs> um, is there any, are there any questions out in the audience? Um, we have maybe some floating mics. It's hard to see. Well, um, here's a question while some people are getting yeah. things together. Um, I have one here. Oh, thanks. Um, this is for you, Dr. Ronhardt. Uh, I guess it maybe could be for both. Dr. Connie Siskowski has worked for more than a decade with a growing number of primary youth caregivers under 18 in her American Association of Caregiving Youth. Are they addressed, are they addressed in the legislation at all? That's a great question. That's a very good question. Um, we're very aware of the issue of children. We're talking they can't go to school. It is a big, big issue. Uh, this is particularly true with multicultural populations. Mm -hmm. uh, some are uh, afraid to even let them know they need help. So it is a big problem. Most of the research we do is on 18 and over, but the National Alliance for Caregiving has studied this group in particular. And there are some efforts, I know New York has done some work with children. There's also the idea of grandparents taking care of children and then those children start taking care of the grandparents. Yes. So it is family. They're just very wide apart in age. Right. Okay. Right. Anything that you yeah, mostly it was making me think we should add to the, uh, in primary care, the question, are you responsible for taking care of somebody else? It's not a question. That, that would be great. Not a question <laughs> that we routinely ask. That would be a good thing. Um, we have a question saying, this is amazing work that you both do. Um, how do you speed up this work as baby boomers become consumers of care? That is really in the beginning of transformation. We may not have the luxury of time as our children become our family, family caregivers. What can academy members do to join in you in aggressively moving this forward? Well, I agree. I'm all about picking up the pace and everything. Long-term care <laughs> reform, I'm always saying, pick up the pace, let's go. Uh, and as I said, it's nice to be in an organization where there's an army in the state level and at the national level to move forward things forward. And caregiving is like huge. It's like top on the dashboard along with Medicare and Social Security. So there is a sense of urgency. And one of the things that is going on now is not just public policy, but the private sector. Mm -hmm. And so we have other group of innovators in ARP who are trying to convince those that have a lot of money, venture capitalists and what have you, to get into this and technology and see if there are really good solutions in technology. It's really not so great right now <laughs> because we tend to develop technology. You know, very young people are developing technology for things that they don't really quite understand. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot about falls and monitoring, which is okay, but that's not what most family caregivers are worried about. Mm -hmm. It's how to reduce the instrumental activities of daily living. I mean, really, Uber helps. Mm -hmm. You can get someone to sure. the to the um, nurse practitioner or whatever and, and getting meals in, uh, that kind of technology. We have to think bigger than what you might think of within caregiving. Yeah. And that's, an, that's uh, interesting, you mentioned Uber, to be able to have them to be to actually drive actually patients mm -hmm. to care, mm -hmm. that's if they're able to afford the type of you know, inf um, sure. ride and so forth sure. to get to the point. But exactly, trying to have these patients be able to have some type of transportation and sometimes patients you know, take off work but they may not have you know, transportation to get to healthcare was a big issue, right? I don't know, I'm kind of imagining a patient showing up in a driverless car now. That's yes. Oh, yes, <laughs> yeah. I think that's happening at Kaiser in California. <laughs> kind of interesting to, I don't think that's gonna happen too quickly. In oh no, Kaiser's practice, In my it. practice. Right. But, you know, I think, um, I think Susan's exactly right. We need to pick up the pace. But my experience working with practices all over the country, mm -hmm. I'm also part of a group called Best Practices, uh, is that there is a real desire to change, but we are kidding ourselves if we think people can just 
say one day we're going to make the change. People really need help. And I admire what CMS has done with these practice transformation networks, funding huge numbers of people across the country by practices to provide the coaching, you know, not the theoretical how to, but come into practices and organizations and really help them make those transformations and how they're delivering care. I think that's been um, a very important piece of it. it. Desire to change is one thing, real tools and strategies and coaching, uh, doing it in a frontline, on the ground way, I think is just critical. Just the recognition that family caregivers exist. Most family caregivers will just tell you they're invisible. The only time anyone talks to them is when they want the billing information. Hmm. So a lot of what we're doing is trying to put a spotlight, first of all, for you to realize you're a family caregiver, uh -huh. right? Of course you're a family member, but you're also providing care. And then for the rest of the world, including employers and including, of course, healthcare systems to recognize that this person mm -hmm. needs support. Mm -hmm. Not by, I mean, I'm emphasizing the medical nursing task, but they need support for themselves in Absolutely. all kinds of ways. Right. Transportation, by the way, is another big area. Right. Mm -hmm. And financial. Financial. Yeah. Right, right. And um, um, Dr. Flair, you mentioned like team-based care health is um, a little bit lacking in some areas. You know, are there ways that our fellows can be, you know, active in trying to move that forward as far as in getting team-based care in multiple different sites, even in those remote areas that may not be as? Sure. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of great resources. Uh, improvingprimarycare.org is a, a website that, uh, w under the LEAP project that I referenced earlier, has collected tools, strategies, how-tos from all over the country uh, and made that readily available. There's a national cooperative agreement uh, that HRSA funds that's posted, uh, focused on advancing team-based care. But a big piece of it is going to be about our next generation. If we don't train our next generation of nurses, physicians, nurse practitioners, behavioral health people in a team-based environment, how do we think they're magically going to go forth and practice in that way? So we really need to make sure that we send our students and our trainees out to organizations that have made them to look for that when we're looking for the places to send our students to. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. I know that you know, in several institutions, they've kind of combined certain like, nursing programs along with, say, the School of Medicine and Pharmacy, so we just have students interact with right. different disciplines so that they can be able to have that core at the very beginning of their um, right. education. So that And then let that different. continue when they go out for their clinical practicums and have, think about training not just to clinical complexity, but really training to that high performance team-based model is really important. Exactly, great. Um, I have another question from the audience. As we look at innovation, what are the key components that you would share with us? What are important barriers to advance in this area? Mm -hmm. so. I'm not sure which area. <laughs> um, well, whoever wrote that question, could you expand on that in what well, area? <laughs> Whatever the area is, I'll say the number one barrier is people don't like to change all that much <laughs> when it's their change. They like change over here, not so much change over here. Right. And I, I would say that the, uh, the most important thing is to involve frontline staff in that change and to have frontline staff trained as coaches who can help people make the change and the data to support it. It sounds simplistic, but I've seen so much uh, resistance to that kind of innovation because the people affected by it are not engaged. And everybody in the room knows that, but we manage to forget it too often when we're doing either small or large change. Mm -hmm. And I think in general, our approach to be systematic and rigorous and studying it, which still has to be done, particularly clinical kinds of activities, but innovation very often has to be fail fast. Yeah. You know, how do you try something? Um, uh, the care at the bedside was an example, TCAB. Mm -hmm. Transforming care at the bedside is an example of that do it, let's try it. Now, there were smaller things, right, exactly. but they made a huge amount of difference. Rapid so cycle. That yep. rapid cycle is very important. Yep. Great. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time uh, for further questions. Although um, we like to thank our presenters who have given us some rules of thought. And I would like to offer any last minute words that you guys like, like to say to the well, I really love that question, what can we do to have Academy members want to engage is why we're here. So anyone, first of all, anyone wants to talk to me, I'm going to be here, uh, happy to talk with you. But to think yourself, uh, family caregivers are all around you. <laughs> they are, you know, 
I think two out of three people who are working as a family caregiver, they're just all around you. So being more aware of that and how you can help people that you know, for example, and to think in your own practice in education, how do we bring them forward? How do we bring them into the practice? They should be part of the team along with the patient. We tend to say patient-centered care to think that includes families. It does not. It's mm -hmm. patient and family-centered care. You have to be explicit if you are truly going to change mm -hmm. the experience of family caregivers in this country. Mm -hmm. right. There's a lot uh, I could say about it, but I, I think if I had an ask, it would be for people to be cognizant of that business case and support it. Support it in your legislative efforts, uh, support it in your organizations as you think about your practices and how they're transforming, and even support it in your own uh, personal domain of how you educate the people around you about some of these transformations. Uh, unless we pull the thread all the way from patients and families, practices and providers, payers both private and public, we don't get a full realization of the benefit of these transformations. And I think everybody in the room is very skillful at traveling up and down that uh, highway from patients and families on through policy and payment reform. Great, great, thank you. So the things that I've heard within this segment is definitely involving the community and helping move this challenge of transforming care, as well as involving policy makers in this whole issue of how do we transform care. And then at the same time, just do something. If, you're, if it's such <laughs> as a big challenge, as you mentioned, do something, don't sit back and um, let it um, go. So we'd like to thank you for great, your thank presentations. You. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> So Randy, Susan, Margaret, that was wonderful. I could have continued to listen forever. However, uh, we need to give you a little bit of a break. And to kick that off, if you remember our healthy interludes from last year, that was a, that was a star attraction. So uh, we're bringing it back. And I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Mary Foley, who will lead us in our healthy interlude. Okay, I know this is a little ironic, me leading the healthy interlude, okay? Let's, um, but I believe in other duties as assigned, and I was asked <laughs> if I would do this. Uh, is my friend Pat Quigley in the room? Pat, are you here? Yeah, okay, good. So you'll like this topic. It's how to reduce falls, right? But I actually think we focus on reducing the injury. I've listened to your lectures, Pat. And I just got back from Japan on Tuesday. So I'm a little jet lagged, but I fell flat on my face on a curb in uh, Japan getting off a bus. And it was, the only thing bruised was the ego, okay? And what I realized, it's not just preventing the fall, but not getting hurt. So we have to learn how to balance and how to fall with grace and get up really fast and not look like a stupid American. So um, anyway, people were so nice and, and I really just missed the curb. So I'm gonna do a couple of um, real quick balance exercises with you and then there is a real break. So if you could stand, please. And if you have heels on, first of all, don't wear heels anymore, okay? And secondly, you might want to take them off unless you're really good on one foot. So um, I thank the, the Academy staff for sending me this. So this is a really simple one. Now I have to hold on. Uh, they say if you can hold on to a chair, that's great. And if you can do it without holding on, you can actually do arm raises. So it's a single, single leg stance. So stand with your legs hip wide apart, uh, keeping your legs equally distributed, straight and unlocked, and basically, one leg at a time, raise a foot behind you for 15 or 30 seconds. So you're basically just getting a little stretch here and little, okay, no one's counting. Have we done 15 yet? Okay. <laughs> and if you can, you let go with both hands and you do parallel lift, which is really very brave and we're flying now, it's really good. All right, foot down and then you'll do the opposite foot. Okay, so raise that other leg, get a little stretch going, a little balance. Okay, a little strength. Diana, you might want to do a couple extra. <laughs> 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 
And what's with all these broken ankles and legs? See, there is something going on out there. So, okay, that was great. Um, one last quick one, because I think you get a real break now. And that is the um, weight shifts again with your leg, uh, legs whip, hip width apart, keeping your arm, legs straight and unlocked. Uh, raise your leg out to the side. So we'll start with the left. And you're shifting over to the other side. Okay, I'm doing my left. I'm holding on, yeah, I, I have to. <laughs> Listen, I have to hold on, and it's okay. It says, if you don't have to hold on, you can move your arms. Okay, legs down, and then we'll do the other side. About 15 seconds, it's almost over, this is good. Okay, great. So um, the other thing this, this really great website recommended is yoga and Tai Chi. Um, but I can tell you I've been doing Pilates, and I think that's why I didn't hurt anything when I fell down. So do the core, get your strength, follow Pat Quigley's advice, uh, pre prevent the injury, and look out where you step. Have a wonderful break. Thanks. <laughs>